guys. I'm, I'm Hannah Benbo, down the end is my colleague Jay Gattuso. So we both work at Punamatorango Aotearoa, the National Library. Um, we're both involved in different aspects of digital collecting and really interested in born digital practice and what that means for collecting institutions. Do we understand contemporary born digital practice well enough? Are we collecting it in a way that reflects what artists need from us as collecting institutions? So to that end, we've gathered together three creators working in different areas. So I've got Jim Yoshioka, who's an illustrator and comics artist, Nikki Hagar, journalist, and investigative author and investigative journalist, and Luke Rowell, who's a musician and also works in the cartoon space. Is that yep. accurate? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to let these three introduce themselves properly in a sec, but I've just got a little bit of housekeeping to do first. Um, so three things. One is that we want this to be a really free, frank and open conversation. Uh, so to that end, our employers have asked us to read out a little disclaimer. Um, make of that what you will. Uh, so the views and opinions expressed in this panel do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Te Puna Matauranga Aotearoa, the National Library. Um, there's one. Two, we've got three questions that we want to focus on. Um, so, what of your work do you want the future to have access to? If you could have access to work from creators who influence you, what would that be? Three, how do you want people in the future to be able to consume your work? And we're going to focus on those questions in sequence. Um, and I'm telling you that because the third thing I want to tell you is that we're going to ask the questions while the conversation's going on. So just raise your hand. Uh, Mike's got them. <laughs> Mike's got the mic. Um, so don't hold it up till the like bottle it up till the end. All right, so let's get started. I might start with uh, giving Luke a chance yeah. to introduce himself. Hello, hi. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing digital software music since like 1996. I kind of started the, on the wave of the early computer music, uh, free software kind of bandwagon and I sort of write pastiche 80s synth pop 90s smooth smooth jazz type um music but it's definitely like born digital stays stays digital on the internet i self-distribute and um self-release more or less all, all my music online um that's basically me uh I, I played a lot in europe and uh done five nearly 500 shows across 22 countries as well um, but yeah my my thing is very digital that's me. Kira Tato, Nikki Haga, Sid Haga. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I work, at, um, I work as mainly as a researcher. I also write books. I wrote my first book in 1999. I published my first book then. I, so I live very much in the world of trying to find out about information, often which is no one's trying to hide, which is scattered or difficult to find but not being hidden, and sometimes which is being hidden. And so I'm very aware of the, um, the blocks and the problems. And I'm also, what I'm going to talk about, I'm in sight live in terror of what to do with my own archives, which I think are value, but I don't, I don't know how to handle them. We'll be talking about that. And also, most, probably most relevant in this room, I'm the family archivist in my family. I love the role of people who look after things, the archives of the world. So, for example, under one of the big beds in our house, we have the archives of my one half of my family escaping from Europe from the Nazis, and it's the most astonishing body of material. And under another of the beds in the house, we've got my um, family living in Africa, other side of my family living in Africa, being doctors. So, and, I, and it's going to be really easy to find out what to do with that compared to the other much larger body of information in my house, which is my work, which was what we're going to talk about. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, my name's Jim Yoshioka, 
Um, I am a comic artist and illustrator, so um, most of my work is created more or less 100% digitally these days um, and has been for quite a while. Um, I have written comics um, about my mixed Japanese heritage and um, I've also been writing a, um, a sort of science fiction webcomic that I'm updating regularly at the moment. So um, my work has found success um, online and so not only am I creating work digitally but that's where my whole audience is. Um, there's a really interesting um, dynamic between sort of the local um, like local Wellington um, engaging with my work via a digital channel so there is still a very physical nature to um, interacting with my work a lot um, but um, yeah that's that's sort of where where a, a lot of my stuff has come from so I'm, I'm interested in sort of talking about um, I guess like how we will be looking after stuff that is just sort of in our in our everyday um, that we don't necessarily think would need to be collected. Um, you know, the, the bits around creating work um, in a digital space or for a digital audience that, um, that people might in the future find quite valuable, which you're not necessarily thinking about now. Um, so, um we're going to work our way through the three questions that um, Hannah proposed. But I think before we do that, I just wanted to invite Hannah to just maybe comment on why we wanted to put this panel together and what we, what we wanted to learn, because I think that's also useful for framing. So, or I can just go first and... I think, I think why don't you <laughs> All right. go into it, Joe? Um, so, so in my, my job, I do digital preservation. So I work in the library and we, you know, my, my job is intrinsically looking at technical objects and, and, and trying to work and understand how do we make sure they can still be consumed sensibly, usefully into the future. Um, in library land, we, we talk a lot about use and reuse. And, and you know, if we can't access things, then, then you know, we kind of have a proposition that's what's the point. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about that. What I um, am particularly interested in, this is why we've assembled um, this amazing panel um, um, today, is, is hearing what people who make this stuff think we should be doing mm. rather than, or as well as what we think we should be doing in library land. So this for us is an exposition in, in, in what these um, colleagues who, who write, paint, draw, make sonically um, phenomenal pieces of work and what they think the long tail of that work should be going into the future. And that's kind of what I'm really interested in getting to the bottom of. So in the end, uh, you know, I think this first question for me is, 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 is where I started um, my conversation with Hannah when we put that together, which is, what of your work do you want the future to have access to? Um, and, um, you know, when we talk about the body of work that we have, I think, you know, 100 years ago, it was relatively easy to ring fence, and he says that without having the first clue. What he's talking about, what a body of works is, it's much less tangible. So I'm going to invite each of our um, panellists to, to spend a few moments reflecting on that question. And you seem to be the scapegoat for going first, Luke. So if you don't mind, uh, if you want to jump in and just have a have a, um, a muse on that for us, because we did we did have a little discussion about this beforehand that was very good. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, for me, I went to music school at Victoria. I could never p pass any papers. Um, I couldn't read notation. But I've always done this kind of computer music. And um, for me, the the question always comes back to like practice. Um, what I would want to uh, see from someone else, and I guess what I would want to pass on, would be the ability to see the actual, what I consider the actual object of the studio music, computer music realm, and that's the session file. That's to be able to see where someone's cut corners or to see where, you know, the shortcuts or the repetitions or the subtleties and what things that would inform my practice because there's, there's really not too much around um, I mean, a lot of there's this YouTube tutorial type thing, but it's not a very sort of it's very technical, technically based. Um, what I would like for people to be able to do with my work is to look right in there and see, you know, possibly where my ideas came from, and and um, you know, get a kind of main line of all these epiphanies that I've had over the last twenty years about writing music that you know someone else could pick up and take away without you know without having to put all that time into rendering it <laughs> so yeah that's that's my thing is that there's the 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 computer music uh practice revolves around this one object that seems to be uh somewhat 
irreproducible without something like a virtual machine or something because you've got file formats, you've got DRM, you've got stolen software, you've got um, all kinds of you know, operating systems and dependencies and viruses and everything. Um, because with, uh, w with standard sort of art music, you've got the score and that's very much the, the thing or, or the performance, but it's a shame that we seem to be making we seem to be making all this useful data that we can't then sort of aggregate down into like a, at an artistic level and say, well, most of your songs are in F major and most of the the things you've worked on are this tempo and you know have this kind of ability to build a language around computer music because it's been around for long enough. There should be, you know, something like that. So that's what what of my work all of it that's that's my question that's my answer all of it i don't mind that people can go through all my awful sessions <laughs> yeah. awesome thank yep. you i would like people to have access to most of my work <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but but by coming along here i've been reflecting on how many problems there are for that and in my case i'm probably the main person in New Zealand, writer, who meets very large numbers of whistleblowers, whistle, very, some of them very important whistleblowers, who have changed history, helped illuminate things, done big things by speaking up, but they've done that on the basis that no one will ever know who they are. And I'm going to talk about that and up to a later question, which is the hardest one for me, but I thought I'd talk about something really, really practical on this, which is that and when I imagine I'm somebody who has I've already had the National Library ask me if, they, if I will give them all my files. They're, they, they're obviously judged to have some worth. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I've been thinking about. So originally I had a large number of, I've obviously for a long time I've had a large number of paper files as well. And I've looked at them and thought, these, one day, and my family once, one day these are going to happily live in an institution. But I know from my own research that um, there can be catastrophes of pe when people put stuff which hasn't been properly sorted into an institution. And so I'm just going to talk about paper files first for a deliberate reason, which, which is that when you've got paper files, someone like me has thought, which year shall I put aside, which would probably be what it would take, just to sort my paper files so I wasn't giving away notes of people who didn't want me or, or people have written to me about the tragedies in their lives or not to mention my own life and family and all that stuff which I would, would not be choosing as, a, as my voluntary act to put out there for you know, other people's eyes, sympathetic or malicious. So that's fine with the paper files, but what I realise is that when you go from a paper file situation where you have roughly chosen what you put in there to a digital world where you have an accumulation of stuff where there's been no thought, there just hasn't been the thought of deleting and that's the only reason why it's there. I'm not sure I've got enough lifetimes left to sort my material properly. And I put this to you because if the National Library or whoever it was would like my files and I would like them to have it, I've got this massive resource barrier of how I sort out back through hundreds of thousands of items of stuff to try to make enough reasonably rational decisions about what goes in there and what doesn't. Because the easier option, is, which is actually what's going on far and wide, is just that computers become hard to uh, access again and people lose them and it all just disappears. That's, that's, it. that's the easiest way to deal with this. Or the children come around and empty out the old person's files when they've died and put them in the dump. We all know that option. That's a really simple one. But if you want it to be saved, um, there is a huge obstacle there which I'm not sure people can do by themselves. And that's my point. That's the challenge or question I'm putting out there is who's going to help? Um, yeah, I think for me, um, I'm, I'm currently in this situation with my past self. Um, for my future, my current self, is that all of my um, work is on old hard drives that I haven't moved off um, since, you know, from, from about sort of. 10 years ago and so that's work that's in a sense kind of locked off to me in a lot of ways unless I do yeah spend a lot of time going through that in order to um, you know de-archive a lot of that stuff to then better archive it to future proof protecting archiving it for the next next round so um so I guess um 
yeah, the, the things, the, the way that I work, I have quite a meticulous um, filing system um, with, with how I sort of sort everything that I make, uh, mainly because I have to, because I'm producing, like when you're making comics, you've just got file after file, page after page, um, and then there's layer after layer of that. So you can actually dig through um, any of the pages that I make in a comic, and it starts off with like a, a rough thumbnail at the bottom layer, and then you can see my sketch layers, and then you can see my colours and my inks, and um, with the, the type on the, on the final layer. So there's all of these sort of, um, yeah, there's um, sort of like a, a living history in each, each page that I put together. And so I keep the high resolution file of that um, on my hard drive. So even though the, the bit that gets sent around everywhere is a, uh, you know, an easy to send JPEG that most people will see, um, I've got this in, in print format if I do ever want to print it off and, and have a, an exhibition of, or um, make a book or um, a printed book or, or anything of, of that nature or cut it up and use it in other ways or share it with other people to remix. Um, you know, so there's, there's all of that that present in the document and it's mostly relatively well named so um, but then uh, outside of that I also um, I don't have a physical sketchbook anymore I only draw pretty much entirely on my iPad and so that that's become my sketchbook and so that's that sort of like little bits and pieces it's notes it's um it's um, you know sketches. It's the the starts of characters. It's the starts of plots and ideas. And when I had physical notebooks, which I did use um, pretty religiously up until last year, um, it was quite nice to be able to flick through and have that physical book and be like, oh yeah, that's this is the first time I ever drew that character, or this is where I came up with that story plot idea, or this sort of element. Um, and then when I'm I don't really ever go through my digital files in the same way. Like I don't have like a nostalgia session where I sit down and go through everything because I don't have to do that when I move. <laughs> yeah. Um. So when you're talking about the work that you're doing on your iPad and all the, um, I don't know if ephemera is the right word, but all those bits and pieces of your practice, um, does that mean that that's primarily stored in the cloud for you these days or would you keep um, copies? I keep copies. Um, it's actually mostly stored directly on the hard drive of the iPad and then I will pull them off and archive them onto my, um, onto my computer. Um, yeah, and then regular archiving stuff from there. So, so yeah, that's... Um, it's yeah, mostly just like living on the iPad. Does anybody else have any questions? So we want to spend a couple of minutes perhaps exploring this. So um, there's a question over here. Thank you. Are you able to make a living from what you're doing now? And do you think your future income might depend on um, capitalising on your existing work, mm -hmm. what you've already made? Is that directed at an individual or a general question? Any, any, anyone want to have a whack at that? Um, I, I think it's, it's actually always quite a difficult um, and complicated question to ask, are you making a living off of your art? Let's maybe focus on the, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> the long tail but The, the long tail, um, I, like I'm, I'm, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways to make a living. I don't think it's ne necessarily relevant uh, to discuss. Um, but yeah, I think there's um, the the thing that I'm more focused on with with creating my work is to create work that um, that can reach people and be shared. Um, and if you know if that ends up being something that is monetarily compensated, then that's great. But I'm more interested in making it work that people can see and experience. Um, I'm always trying to feed into this. Um, I I started with the with a kind of streaming model in mind when I was sort of eighteen, nineteen on MP3.com and Iuma and all these early um, MP3 sites. But um, the the thing I'm always trying to build on this the streaming thing is you put one album out and then you'll put another album out and then it always feeds back through your back catalogue. But in terms of this question, it's like especially for audio, we can't get any higher fidelity. You know, when Neil Young's trying to sell us on one hundred ninety two kilohertz audio and it's like um not even that uh useful. But um <clears throat> in terms of this stuff, like I've had to I've had stuff put out by record labels and then had to get the files back when they don't, don't pay me and I've got to then put the stuff up on, on Spotify to try to recoup from that. And it's like this, this file management archiving thing 
it comes up every time with music. Maybe not in terms of the, the musical object itself, but everything around it needs to be, you know, the, the, the streaming stores always want more higher fidelity art or, you know, you're always trying to keep up with it. So you do have to keep everything archived in that sense. To what extent do you think about or pay attention to the terms of use and other sorts of legal frameworks that govern your relationships with these um, platforms, whether they're streaming or whether it's a hardware platform if you're storing on your iPad? How much does that enter into your thought process? Um, it does. Like, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a part of being a, a digital artist is to think about where your, your work is being shared. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of choice in terms of en engaging with these platforms um, and these, these technologies. You know, you might find some of the conditions a little bit, a little bit squiffy, but there's, there's, uh, that's the only way you can really get your work out at the moment um, and so like the main place that I am sharing my webcomic at the moment is a, is a private company um, that lets you use it for free um, and then they advertise underneath it and um, and so pretty much they just ask that you're not going to put porn up and that's that's about it um, and um, it's it's been it's been a, a relatively good relationship um, for me as a as an artist and I think I've got about 40,000 subscribers through using that platform, which I wouldn't have otherwise, um, if I'd set up, you know, on my own server, or, um, or you know, yeah, there's just I wouldn't have the um, I wouldn't have the access. So, but that is definitely a trade-off. Me knowing that by doing that, I'm giving them a certain amount of access and rights to using my work in specific ways. It's mostly dead at, like the most of them are just so that they can actually share and distribute um, your files. But yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about what I do in terms of having like a more of a more cloud storage archiving, and um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm thinking about which which of the services that are all run by private companies are going to be the most um, yeah the sort of most tolerable for what I want to be doing with my work. Do either of you have any? Basically in the same position. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next question, if there's no one with a burning question. So, Hannah, do you want to? Before we move on, I just, um, Nikki, we can totally help you sort through your files. OK, our next question. Uh, if you could have access to work from creators who influence you, what would that work be? So that's kind of the question of, are you interested in that finished product? Is it the shavings? Is it somewhere in between? And how does that kind of play out in the digital space? <laughs> um, if you're thinking about a sculptor, right? You've got like the, the shavings of the stuff that's being sculpted. You've got the final sculpture. You've got something somewhere in between. Yeah, what interests you in the work of others who you find influential? Should we start with? Start with you, Jim. I mean, I always love sketches and process. I mean, that's that's something that I find really interesting as an artist is seeing the the little bits of things and the, the thought process behind stuff. So um, that's definitely the work that um, that I'm drawn towards when um, when I um, of of artists who I really like and um, and appreciate the work of because it's through that that you can see um, can see the initial structures of, of of how those finished pieces came to be. Um, I, I you know studying art history it's always quite neat to see sort of like the initial sketches before the the final paintings and the relationship between the studies and what the final work ended up being and I think that's um, that's a really interesting space um, and and there's always a lot of very interesting historical context around um, around artwork and around um, around yeah what what's um, what ends up being the finished product, and I think that's um, that's the bit that I think is is the most interesting to me and the most important to being captured because it's also the easiest to lose. I think is that sort of wider cultural context that the work's been created in, um, and so yeah. Does that mean you put some pressure on yourself to make your own workings work in progress? Accessible, yeah. Um, sometimes, I mean, I guess because I'm a fan of other people's sketches, I tend to share a lot of mine um, on on Twitter and stuff as I'm as I'm going because it seems like that's yeah, it's just it's what I like, so I assume that other people like it too, and um, yeah, so it's quite nice to be able to put something out there and be like, here's here's the sort of you know the pre thing, mm. yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Compl 
completely different genre. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the people I re whose work I re really respect, um, I get the pleasure out of seeing the way that they put their work together. But if I were talking about what I would like, I would like to see, of course, what their original source is. And we never do, unless they're a buddy, unless you make friends with them, and there's collegiality all around the world, as you know, you don't actually get to see it. And so I'll talk about a slightly different thing, because that's, that's my whole answer there. Um, living in the realm of information and trying to find solid information in the world of incredibly shifting digital sands, um, I'm very aware of how much stuff is solidly around and then it disappears again. And one of the, like, to illustrate this, one of the main websites that I go to over and over again is the Internet Archive, archive.org. And the reason I'm doing this is that the thing that the people, the, the, the official reports or the, the um, list or the, uh, the, the press release which was up there yesterday might not be up there today or it might be slightly different because there's nothing... Stuff on the internet doesn't, hasn't gone to an institution which guarantees it doesn't change. It's constantly changing. In fact, hunting in the fields where I hunt, which is for information all the time and searching and looking and so on, I get a very good idea of how impermanent the internet is on all sorts of informational ways. And so if it, well, <coughs> if it wasn't for the people who'd set up the internet archive, I would be at a, a great loss all the time. And that there, aren't, there aren't many internet archives, and there aren't varieties of internet archives. There's only, you know, the, I always have to go back to the same one generally. So it's a really big deal. And it makes me think about, as I say, when I work in original sources and source materials constantly in different ways, not just where individual things are going, but whole great swathes of stuff, which I know, I'm just certain, are not going to be around in the future. The publications which were only, you know, you, I, I'm looking at a publication for some industry organisation or company or something, and I've got the last five, but they don't have any of the ones before that. And how many companies are even existent a generation later? It's really big. If I might just add a quick question. What do you do about that? In your, in your practice, what's your coping mechanism for this transient nature of information on the web? Well, what's, what's my coping mechanism? As I say, every time I look at something on the internet which where the, I've got a question in my mind, I then go and look at the earlier versions on the internet archive and so often it's changed mm. or it's been for a certain type of while and then it's disappeared. Mm. Uh, what it means that, and for example, after September 11, before September 11, the United States military and government organisations were amazingly rich in information. They had a strong tradition of public, public information. And it was like lights went out <laughs> all over the place. And they've, n it's, they've never come on again. And so we, you can feel like you've made progress and you've got this flag in, 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 in the sand and, you, and you're going to get in the, in the rock, I mean, and you're going to have information forever, but you don't have it forever, mm. which means that people are tempted to try to save it all themselves. Mm. But you can't do that. Mm. It's actually not practical. So, you, so when I find stuff, I, of course I save safety copies of things which I find all the time as a precaution. But what we actually need is other people making safety copies. The way that the National, Archi National Library, I think it is, has a system for people's New Zealand websites, which I think is really crucial, and then multiplied by a thousand or a million. Yeah. Thank you. I think my answer is going to be pretty in line with Jim. Like, um, I like, I like it when you can hear just the vocal take of a song, you know, you can look at that in YouTube and you can just hear one part of it and it's like being able to have that sort of vision of someone else's music uh, just to get down to the parts. I'm kind of like hyper obsessed with getting ideas and getting the idea out and getting it out as quickly as possible and, you know, trying to, uh, I don't know, I'm always uh, looking for the way that in the last two or three years, trying to find some sort of practice involved with sort of computer music and, and home recording. Um, yeah, what would I say? Yeah, I, I want to see someone's, someone's rubbish bin and, you know, um, all their outtakes and stuff. I've started actually on my sessions, if something doesn't work out, I just throw it to the right and then I've got, oh, because I work in my lounge, I'll play through a song and then it'll go and I'll go make a coffee and then a minute later there'll just be all this garbage 
and then I, so I can listen back to all the garbage that I've generated and sometimes there's, a, there's another idea in there. But it's about, yeah, if I could see someone else's garbage, that would be amazing. That would be, I could spend weeks with that. Do you have uh, any questions? Anyone? Um, well, I, 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 as always, have a billion questions. Um, oh, there was a hand. Sorry, I didn't see it. Oh. Sorry, I'm sure your question was really good as well. <laughs> I um, Nikki, I, I just you touched on this slightly about, and I just really wanted to know, with, with resources like the Internet Archive out there, what role do you see... New Zealand institutions taking to support that digital collecting? Like what, is that, is, does it need to be more than collecting New Zealand websites? Or what, 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 is, what does that look like and what, what, how would that support your work? Thank you. The Internet Archive is great, but half the time the stuff's not there or the layers down out there. And so if it were possible to, for a country to care about its own material more than others and have an equivalent of that, it would be, it would be heaven. That's what I'm saying. So, yes, websites, but, um, but a wide, unlikely variety of websites. I don't know how wide you go. I, imag I just can't imagine that you, you cover the full range of stuff the Internet Archive does at the moment. Um, I, so I had a question for the for the um, to um, uh, music the music and and and, uh, and uh, illustrative side. How do you think you then encourage people to share their practice in a way that will help inform yours? You know, is there a is there a modality here that 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 we can all kind of work towards that encourages that to happen? Um, I guess we kind of have that a little bit with with the internet. Um, and just the way that there is, you know, if we're talking from other contemporary um, people working in this space, uh, people do um, share like their their Photoshop files so that you can see how they put a picture together. Um, you can watch videos of people putting putting um, you know um, their illustrations together, so you can learn um, you know watch their painting techniques and and all of that kind of stuff. A lot of people are pretty um, pretty awesome about sharing you know, when they find something cool and new. Um, a lot of people make cool brushes that they share, so you can go and you can download a, a different brush set. Um, and some people monetize those and some people don't. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely, a, um, you know, an artist community where we are all supporting each other and sharing these sorts of resources amongst each other. Um, and there's also, you know, like, um, like live streaming and people just, you know, put their, put their screen up with their... With their um, you know, I'm being like, I'm working on a comic, just come along and hang out while I draw this. <laughs> and so, yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, I guess it's, it's community really that, um, and it seems to pretty much already be happening. So, yeah. I thought about live streaming music, but then I realised no one wants to watch me work on like one loop for two hours, because <laughs> that's what I do. Um, I've, s I think there is a bit of, especially, especially with electronic music, a bit of, uh, this expectation that you've got to cultivate a mystique and you've got to use, you know, vintage uh, 70s synthesizers and you can't use software and, um, you know, plugins are kind of inferior and they're not macho and um, it's, it's kind of weird. So what I tend to do is share a lot of, um, be quite upfront about uh, the software that I'm using and, and, you know, giving away more secrets and sharing pictures of session files and stuff or, you know, try to, work a little joke in there if there's some sort of electronic music joke or whatever. But um, yeah, I've, I've, I've tr always tried to be quite upfront about my tools and about trying to, um, especially with a lot of the free software stuff I've worked with, is, is trying to be very upfront that this stuff's free and it's, you know, it's easy to do and um, yeah. So just trying to be more upfront, I guess, and honest and not like, oh, this is my, you know, genius masterwork that I made on a you know, vintage synth synthesizer from 1972. Just be like, it's a plug-in, you buy it here, and it looks like that, you know. Thank you. Um, we'll probably move on to the last question, because the clock's ticking. Oh, if it's a super quick one. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, all right, so the last question. Um, oh, that was the wrong way. Which is, 
about use and reuse, and it's something which we think about heaps in library land. So the, the question is, um, as framed, how do you want people in the future to be able to consume your work? So I'd like to start with Nikki, if that's all right. Thank you. <coughs> First part of the answer is very easy. I would, I would look forward to a day where um, all my books, all my articles, all my writing is permanently preserved as part of New Zealand materials in a digital way. I'm very happy with that. I don't need to get revenue off with all my family. That would be fine. What I said, I, but I've, I've got this problem about my, my research materials, which I mentioned, and I want to talk a little bit about that because I don't know the answer apart from a huge bonfire and smashing up of hard drives one day. And that is that I've had many, many people trust me to give me very classified or very, very in sensitive information. I've had to make all kinds of judgments about which bits are reasonable to use and which stuff should never be used, or, or what's, what's public business and what's private business, and I shouldn't touch the private business. I've had got to go through all those processes, and it seems like a crime to me that I will take all those materials one day and smash them into little pieces. But on the other hand, I've got these really, you know, serious responsibilities to the people. And, I've, and I imagine it's a bit like other kinds of archives, like, you know, one of these days people will be able to open up their archives as a security intelligence service or, you know, John Key, the ex-Prime Minister, and see the embarrassing bits and the good bits, but who cares because it'll be so long dead, everyone concerned, it won't matter. But is that going to work for my kind of material? And I don't, I don't, actually, don't actually know anyone who has my job who ever takes that risk. And so my question back to all of you a lot would be, um, would I be safe enough? Would an would access agreement trump <laughs> somebody coming around and wanting it? And otherwise, I'm going to have to smash it all and burn it all. And I don't like that, but that will obviously be the right thing. Thank you. Um, well, I guess the, the finished product is obviously the thing that I want people to be able to consume in the future. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I do want people to feel free to reuse and remix what it is that I create into, into stuff of their own. Like I've, I've come from um, a sort of Creative Commons background and um, I found quite a lot of success by releasing my art and illustrations under, um, you know, like a, a relatively open Creative Commons license. So I, I do like the idea of putting my work out there in a way that people can um, reinterpret and re reuse and retell stories. Um, so if I'm if I if my work gets used in that kind of a way um, that into the future, that's um, that'd be really awesome for me. Yeah. Does that go? Do you think for your workings as well as for your finished? Project? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, full hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Did I? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I've been. Uh, I use Creative Commons non-commercial uh, just as a way of securing peer-to-peer uh, -peer distribution for forever, hopefully. Um, and that, hopefully, <laughs> within my understanding of Creative Commons, if there is a sort of commercial part of the process, I can sort of negotiate that separately. But um, yeah, I've got no problem with anyone doing anything with my work, uh, as long as there's attribution. Um, I can't think of a single sort of thing that would uh, sort of I turn, my, turn my nose up at. Um, yeah. Trusting it will just live on the internet forever. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> whatever corporation runs the dominant streaming platform will will retain my work. <laughs> so, so Nick, Nikki's question, if you didn't hear it, was: Are you trusting that the, it will live on the internet forever? Which I think is a very salient um, point. I, I really haven't thought about that. <laughs> Um, Jim, I wanted to just pick up on on, um, on something you said. So you you um, described your workflow as being 100% digital, and um, I know in our previous conversation you talk about the, your iPad, which is essentially your notebook. Do you see that as being a physical object that 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 would be interactable with into the future, or is it is it your your um, final products, which are more what you think about? Um, I mean, the, the iPad itself is not very important. Like, you know, I can just plug in another one in and the brain just moves from there to the to the other one. You know, you could very easily clone it and have, you know, have a bunch of copies. I don't think there's... Yeah, and the, the file formats that I work in on there don't necessarily... Um, yeah, there's nothing about, them, about the iPad itself that I think you'd need to keep 
at four. Although it is fun to sort of be able to zoom in and out on stuff. Mm. But um, yeah, no, I, I don't think it's um, sort of format specific um, for any reason other than, you know, people might be interested in knowing that that was the sort of surface I like to work on. But I'm sure like in, in you know, less than a year, I'll have like a completely different kind of tablet set up because uh, technology just moves so fast. So um, yeah, unlike a sketchbook, which which has like that this sort of very, um, you know, it's, it, I feel like I, I was looking through a, a couple of my um, physical sketchbooks the other day for, for something and it does have quite a specific form of nostalgia and kind of importance to it that scrolling through my archive of files is never going to be feel like anything other than a chore. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if there is a way to replicate the feeling of having a notebook now that I don't really keep them anymore um, or if it's just something that I've lost in my work um, which you know I've traded I guess more than more than, than lost um, mm. for the for the ease of use and the um, and the flexibility of having a digital um, a digital surface to to sketch on yeah so thank you and Nikki I wondered if you um, had any thoughts around how your your contact with your uh, um, informants or, or sources might have changed over the years as you've thought about what it means to have an archive and, and that, that might outlive yourself. Have you changed how you approach that question of permanence of their information within your own archive or is that something you, you address with them at all? That's a, did everyone hear that's a very hard question? So this is meeting people who meeting someone from a government department or meeting a minister or meeting a soldier or something who's telling me something. My, my need to be faithful and protecting of them mm. means that I become less digital yeah. as the years go on yeah. in my interactions with them, which is strange <laughs> and um, not what I would have expected, but it's an, it's an absolute necessity, which means that I don't you know, if somebody wants to seize my computers or something, they will never find that because that's the last thing I would possibly put there. Yeah. yeah. That's just the answer. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, any questions? We've got about 10 minutes left of the session. We've got quite a bit of time. So if anyone have any questions on this specifically? Hi. Thank you, all your panelists. These are great answers to get to hear from real creators. Um, I have a question. How do you feel if your material never goes to an archive? Are you working under the assumption that it will go somewhere and be collected? Or would you be OK if it wasn't ever collected by anyone? Yeah, I'd be fine with that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I don't make work. Um, you know, I make work for myself and, I guess, for contemporary people. And so the um, yeah who are who are sort of participating in my work as I make it almost um, or watching me make it um, yeah that's one of the cool things about a web comic is that I have readers who are sort of coming along with me in real time as I'm working on a story um, which can be interesting and frustrating but it's um, you know it's kind of like as much for for those people in the moment as it is for a um, as a sort of final finished product at the end. Um, and then I guess the thing the thing is that that I might be a digital practicing artist, but um, but print is still a huge part of being a digital artist. Um, so even though all of the creation of my work is happening within the digital space, um, I sort of think like it's not really finished finished until it's actually printed out and in a book somewhere. So um, yeah, there's still this relationship between uh, you know being a sort of published artist or published author. Um, you know I still will be. Um, hopefully being able to make print books in the future that I don't think print's going to die. Um, so, um, you know, those will by necessity be archived. And so I think that there's, you know, it's okay if like every little sketch that I do doesn't end up somewhere special because it's, um, you know, it was just a warm up or just, you know, half an eye that I did. <laughs> Although my mum still has like all my paper from when I was a kid, which includes like, yeah, this, all my, my childhood drawings. Yes. <laughs> so she's my, she's my archivist. I, I think I've been working under that assumption. I, 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 maybe that's a bit narcissistic. But um, <laughs> um, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still archiving my own stuff and I'm, I, I sort everything kind of meticulously. So um, 
it'll be somewhere, and I always think it'll be somewhere, but that's fingers crossed. That's my short answer. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm different from that, actually. Um, uh, to me, I would have thought one of the sort of the, the, the obvious ideas and sort of tragedy of archives is that they get their value later and people don't really see them as valuable at the time. That's almost like by definition. And so do I care about my family papers? Deeply. <laughs> You know, I'd feel like I'd let down everyone if I didn't look after them. But my own stuff, I don't, feel, I don't care yet, actually, <laughs> to be honest. I, I want my books to persist. I want my work to persist, which are already in the world. But my working stuff, I only think it in theory. I don't feel it yet, actually. Isn't that funny? That's cool. Thank you. Great. Um, there's another question. It is one? Yep. Um, this question's probably primarily for Nikki, but for anyone on the panel. Um, there's been a little bit of talk around sort of uh, creatives as part of a community and um, kind of participating in that community as you create. Um, but I think any time, um, Nikki, you release a, a output from a major piece of work, then New Zealand becomes the community and it tends to... Um, you know, a big conversation will arise out of that. And I wonder if you have any comment to make on um, how we record and archive how New Zealand responds to um, your major pieces of work and possibly similar question about um, sort of archiving fan communities and that sort of thing for the other panellists. Man, that's hard. <laughs> I don't know the answer actually, but what I'll say is, what I find with most things, I make some things happen sometimes, but things happen all the time, right? And when things happen, what I find is that the bit that's usually missing is the person who, at the time, who collects and analyzes and understands what's going on as opposed to just another thing happened. And, <coughs> and that, in terms of, the, sort of what you're asking about my work, which sometimes it prompts a, a debate uh, or a, a reaction of some sort. I'm not sure that the archiving bit is the bit that which, I'm, that some of the archiving happens anyway because news news sources are retained, you know, and um, you know news archives save their own stories and things. But I, I think there's an interesting um, role f for the people who bother to analyze and collect at that time, and that would be a, that would be the most useful thing to do. Is out of all the clutter in the context of that time to understand it at that time and, and save that. Does that make sense? I, I, I have some thoughts. Um, there was a, like a aesthetic music scene that emerged in 2011, 2012 that's become quite big called Vaporwave and that um, seemed to come out of like a net art Tumblr type community um, and that all this stuff sort of happened online, it's like pretty internationalized sort of uh, base of artists making this style of music and imagery but when you go back to look at the the, the sites where these 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 internet communities spread came up they, they don't exist anymore there's no there's no record of any of it so yeah in terms of my practice stuff like that's already happened and it's come and gone because it comes and goes on the internet so yeah like a, a lot of sort of stuff you know goes down on like 4chan and uh, you know these sort of places of ill repute, but um, yeah. So that's the, the worst has already happened, in, in my opinion, for some some of these kind of um, internet art movements that have kind of disappeared. Yep. The worst being the worst, mm. the worst disappearance. Right. So that oh, they've, they've gone. Oh yeah, like the, you, you, it it comes and it's it's born on the internet. It dies on the internet, but you don't you don't get to see the start of it because no one you know no one picked yeah. it up. Gotcha. Yep. Thank you. Well, it's a great meme archive that lets you know how old memes are. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's um, it's probably quite similar answer to Luke in terms of um, yeah that how that sort of stuff um, yeah within within sort of the web comic community you know if especially if it's sort of like a self-hosted comic it's very easy for an artist to say have a um, you know decide that they actually they don't want to share their work anymore and just pull it all down and so. Um, yeah, it can, you know, and then th that's just sort of gone from, from the internet or, you know, reshared as lower and lower quality JPEGs across 
time um, with names cropped off. <laughs> um, yeah, like loss of attribution to comics is a huge thing um, with, with work being shared um, by li like literally aggregate accounts that, um, that then sort of strip the, um, strip the names off quite often intentionally um, in order to get, you know, hundreds of thousands more, more attention um, you know, more retweets, more more reblogs um, than the original artist. Uh, meanwhile, the original artist is not even make, being able to make a living off of their um, their hard work. But you know, this is fine dog, so you should you know all know. <laughs> um, there's, there's that one, there's one web comic that someone made about I made this, and then the guy oh, yeah. texts like, no, I made this. But I've seen that without the watermark, and it's like the you know yeah that's yeah the joke. exactly yeah it's become its own. It's sort of its own reference to itself. So um, yeah, so I think that's um, that's something that I think is as a as a huge challenge for the community now, which isn't really what you asked, but it's sort of relevant. How do you, how do you find out? You know, how do you, how do you find out um, if, if your work's being stolen? Yeah. Um, usually, like a, a, a dedicated Wii fan will will find it, and then they'll they'll sort of shoulder tap you and be like, "Did you know this Chinese website is selling T-shirts with your work on it?" like oh, oh they shouldn't be doing that mm. um yeah so or yeah this has been shared thousands of times from this um you know this um other other sort of yeah problem account and and the people who do it don't think that they're doing anything wrong because it's just the internet and it's just pictures on the internet and there's what's copyright i've never heard of that so yeah we we probably have time for one more question if there is if there's any remaining one more question there's a hand up the back there <clears throat> we'll try and be succinct if we can, just we've got five more minutes. Um, I have a question for Nikki. You talked about how you've got quite a lot of sensitive information and that you might potentially have to destroy that. Do you not feel that you have a duty to protect that from censorship? Very fair question. I've, I've got two competing duties. I've got the duty which is that I owe it to history and um, future people that they can see it and I've, uh, sometime and I've got the duty to the people who, who gave me things you know sometimes sometimes in the little ways and sometimes by the gigabyte um, that they, I, I promised I would protect their their identity forever and I <coughs> and I'm saying I don't know the answer and and out of those obligations I, sp I suppose I'll tell the truth out of those obligations if I had to choose I'll destroy it. I, I can't get out of that, but I wish there was an option E, of C, I mean. <laughs> Thanks. All right, um, so I think we're basically at time. So, um, you know, for me, this has been a, a phenomenally illuminating session. I'm grateful that we're recording this because I know that I've heard more than I can kind of process while sitting here and trying to absorb the things that you guys have said. And for me, the main things that I was kind of hearing um, is that deleting isn't a thing as we move into digital work streams. So um, we just end up with more stuff. We, can't, we don't do the same rigors of the paper archive of weeding on the way. We just kind of don't delete it and, and kind of move into another bigger pile. And that's going to cause us a problem um, when we move into the future. And I've really enjoyed the commentary around um, practice and, and, and recording of one's own practice and recording it to share um, and particular the conversations around the structure of object even back to original sources in the written material for me there's, there's a theme there um, and absolutely enamored by the idea of seeing someone else's rubbish bin that's kind of like stuck with me I wrote it in big letters and draw lots of circles around it because I thought it was very cool um, so anyway I, I've really enjoyed the session and I, would, I hope you all join me in thanking um, our panel for a really really amazing conversation I could have spent another hour having this unfortunately we don't so thank you very much for giving up your time and joining us today thank you Thanks.